Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. My name is Dr. Elise Toth. Um, on behalf of Align Modern Health, I welcome you into our, um, our webinar today, the Quarantine 15, Addressing Unwanted Weight Gain Through Functional Medicine. So let's get started. So just a little bit about Align Modern Health before we get started into the actual presentation. Um, we are an integrative medicine company, um, treatment plans here at Align Modern Health. We try to find the root cause of what's going on. We also, we treat the whole person rather than just a list of symptoms or a single symptom or condition. And the tools that we have in our toolbox are chiropractic or physical medicine. Um, so you're right, the, the chiropractor you would think of. Um, we also have acupuncture, we have clinical massage therapy, and then functional medicine and clinical nutrition, which if you're not familiar with, you'll get a little bit more of an insight into today. So that's a little bit about Align Modern Health. Um, so a little bit about my background. Um, I currently practice out of the Andersonville and Vernon Hills clinics. Um, I received my doctorate of chiropractic medicine in 2018 from the National University of Health Sciences in Lombard and uh, my Bachelor of Science in Kinesiology from the University of Illinois at Chicago. And my practice specialties are gastrointestinal disorders. So I love to treat IBS, Crohn's disease, um, SIBO, ulcerative colitis, that sort of thing, um, Hashimoto's thyroiditis, as well as other autoimmune thyroid disease, as well as headaches and migraines. So it's kind of a small taste into what I do. Um, so let's talk about, well, first and foremost, I would like to start off by saying that there is no, this is not about the ideal getting skinny. Um, there's no one right type of body. We need to give thanks to our bodies, whatever they look like, wherever we are in our journey is where we need to be today. Um, yeah, there, I, I, the one thing that really, really just makes me so enraged is the idea that everyone needs to be with a certain body type, skinny and that's it, end of discussion. And I personally don't agree with that. Um, however, I also realize that everyone is somewhere different in their journey. Some people are right where they want to be. Some people are not. And maybe, you know, if you tuned in today, it's because you, you do have a few pounds that maybe you'd like to lose. Um, and we're here to help with that. But just know that what's on the scale, the number on the scale is not the whole story. So I, I kind of, I thought this picture was funny. Uh, the little girls stepping on the scale saying, don't step on it. They make you cry. Well, for some people they do, but um, until you learn a little bit more that the number on the scale is really not just, right, it doesn't take into account anything but just your, your body weight. It doesn't take into account your body composition. So it doesn't take into account, yes, we, we always kind of equate the scale, the number on the scale going up means that fat mass is going up. Not always the case. There's fat mass, there's lean muscle mass. So um, right? That's what we, when we're exercising, that's oftentimes what our goal is to increase bone density is also a very big, um, big contributing factor to when, when we're exercising and we're like, okay, we think the number should be going down, but it's not. It's because bone mass oftentimes is increasing. Um, and also water mass, the majority of our body is water and that also it needs to be reflected. So something I've recently incorporated into my practice is smart scales. And if you're not familiar with what a smart scale is, um, a smart scale has um, impedance. So it has electricity that it sends up um, and it is able to take a look and see or estimate with an algorithm what the percentages of all those different tissues are in your body, fat mass, muscle mass, bone mass, and water. Um, so that way, instead of just looking at the scale and seeing the number go up or go down, it takes into account your body composition, which is pretty awesome. And that's um, unfortunately not what broader um, medical practices utilize all the time. Um, according to a recent survey by the American Psychological Association, 61% of US adults reported undesired weight gain since the COVID-19 pandemic began. 40% of the adults who were surveyed reported an average weight gain of 29 pounds, so that means some less, some more. And then about 10% of the adults surveyed reported gaining about 50 pounds or more. So that just was the, the research that I saw um, could be more or less uh, accurate, um, you know, depending on where everyone's situation is. So let's keep going forward. So that's the what, the undesired weight gain. Come on now. 
There we go. So the why, why are we all of a sudden, you know, the, the things we were doing in the past are no longer working for us to try to lose weight now. So there is to no surprise to anybody, lifestyle changes brought on by the pandemic, right? The pandemic and lockdown really flipped our entire lives upside down. So eating habits changed. Um, we are more sedentary than we've ever been, high stress levels as well, and then altered sleeping habits due to all of these factors. So the why, so eating habits. So emotional eating, I know a lot of us hear that term very often. And emotional eating is defined as eating in response to how you're feeling, especially when you're not hungry. So kind of the, the physiology behind emotional eating, um, there are situations that can cause stress and that ramps up cortisol production. So you'll see cortisol is in green. We're gonna be coming back to cortisol a lot. Um, and cortisol is released from our adrenal glands, which sit on top of our kidneys like hats, and that's our stress hormone. So stress increases cortisol production in the body, and that can cause things like anxiety, hypervigilance, hyperalertness, depression, um, and all of these increase our body's demand for energy. So right. We're like, yeah, that sounds familiar. That was like the entire last year and a half for the most part. Um, increased demand for energy causes cravings for really rich calorie dense food and excess calories, right, that we're craving and that we eat then are deposited as abdominal fat. So fat in our midsection because of where it is in our body, it has uh, expedited access to the liver because of its location, right? And so therefore our bodies are smart and they're going to deposit our energy reserves to the place that's the quickest that can break it down and utilize it for energy. Um, abdominal fat also, it sends feedback to your brain telling your brain, hey, listen, we've got this, we're fine, don't worry about it. And that's, that's kind of the, the feedback loop. So that decreases our symptoms of anxiety, but unfortunately when anxiety heightens again, that whole process starts over. So we keep reaching for these foods because they are emotionally comforting to us because our body and our brains are smart because they know if they calm us down. So it's really, really difficult, right? As we've experienced to make healthy eating choices when we're emotionally eating. The, another big reason, and I know I myself am absolutely included in this from the past year, is many of us increase our alcohol consumption. Um, of the survey, there's a survey that New York University School of Public Health released um, in 2020. 29% um, of people that answered reported an increase in alcohol consumption during the early part of the pandemic, right? We go grocery shopping, we slip a few more bottles of wine in our, in our cart, and like, what else are we going to do? Let's go home and drink, and it helps us forget about things for a while. Um, though the interesting part of this study showed that those who were experiencing depression were 64% more likely to increase alcohol intake whereas those experiencing anxiety were 41% more likely to increase alcohol intake. Pretty staggering numbers, right? And so the additional calories from the carbohydrates, right, the sugar and the alcohol itself also kind of brought our guard down, brought our inhibitions down, and made it much easier for us to not make such great eating choices while we were intoxicated. Another reason um, for our... Uh, potential weight gain is sedentary lifestyle, right? We were working from home and there was a bunch of physical activity that was lost during our, our normal workday. So, right, we, we never really, you know, think about it too much, but even the commute to and from your car or the train or the bus, both from your house and on your way to the office, um, walking around in the workplace. So whether you're walking around talking to colleagues, going between floors, going to the bathroom, um, as well as, I don't, I mean, I don't know about you, but myself, I definitely um, am more of a going to exercise, like intentional exercise is on my way to or from work. And when gyms were shut down and when we weren't going to work, those habits were also broken just because we weren't able to utilize them the way we once were. So decreased access to physical activity, like I said, it was definitely a big factor. Gyms were closed during the initial phases of lockdown. There was a back order of home exercise equipment. I know my sisters and I tried to order a Peloton. They were like, yes, it'll be delivered in three to six months. I'm like, I don't have three to six months to wait for that. No, thank you. That's okay. Um, as well as lack of space to exercise at home, especially those of us who were in smaller living quarters or living with other family members and just didn't have the space to either exercise or put exercise equipment. Um, another shift was media digestion, right? Especially in the beginning part of the pandemic, we were bored. We were 
not used to having so much time on our hands. So binge watching shows on whatever streaming service that we had, um, social media use because we were able to be together without being together, more time for books, more time for reading, just more time for sedentary activities in general. Okay, so all uh, higher stress levels. Let's talk about this. So to talk about this, I want to start with our um, nervous system. So our brain, our spinal cord, and how all of that controls everything. So our autonomic nervous system, if you're not familiar with it, its primary function is to maintain what we call homeostasis. So maintain equilibrium. It controls our digestion, controls metabolism, blood pressure, our bowel habits, urinary habits, heartbeat, sexual response, body temperature, breathing rate, and fluid balance. There's two portions of our, of our autonomic nervous system, our parasympathetic nervous system and our sympathetic nervous system. So most people are really familiar with our sympathetic nervous system, our fight or flight system, but not so much with our parasympathetic nervous system, our rest and digest. So our sympathetic nervous system is fight or flight. It prepares our body for the potential of danger. It dilates our pupils. Um, decreases our saliva, quickens our heartbeat, makes our airways relax so that way we can take in more oxygen, our bladder relaxes, digestion is inhibited, that's why we're not supposed to eat too much before we exercise, um, and also adrenaline and cortisol, so there's cortisol again, um, are released into the bloodstream because it's our, there are stress hormones. Whereas on the flip side of that, our parasympathetic nervous system, our rest and digest, brings the body into a state of calm. So our pupils contract, our saliva production is stimulated, our heartbeat slows down, our airways constrict, our bladder contracts, and we're able to digest once again. So we, we generally are in you know, one or the other of these states during the day. And in our current lifestyle, more so in sympathetic than in parasympathetic, unfortunately. The physiology of cortisol. So cortisol is released, right, as we established when we have high stress levels. High stress levels cause an increased amount of cortisol to be secreted into our body. That elevates glucose, which is our blood sugar, and insulin, which takes up our blood sugar and brings it into our cells for fuel. And when insulin and glucose are both high, we have trouble burning our fat. And that causes an increased rate of fat storage. Also, our body is saving that fat for a rainy day just because we're, our body, if it's in danger, right, if we're stressed, we don't realize there's a difference between work stress, pandemic stress, being chased by a bear stress, and our body doesn't know when we're going to be able to let our guard down again. So it's, it's making sure that it has all the resources necessary for us at our disposal, which over longer and longer periods of time can start to cause problems. Altered sleep habits. So sleep is a big one um, and both of, right, so um, increased stress and more sedentary lifestyle also is going to alter our sleep habits. So mental hyperarousal, right, trouble falling asleep and trouble staying asleep, one and or the other. Um, and then as far as sleep is concerned, there's a really good book that I recommend to all of my patients. It's called Why We Sleep by Matthew Walker. And that's where I pulled all of these studies and this data from. Fantastic, highly recommended. You can get it on Amazon. It's worth the read. Um, and the studies have shown that less than seven hours of sleep per night increases the probability of weight gain because there's an imbalance of leptin and ghrelin. So leptin is our hunger hormone, or no, I take that back. Leptin is our satiety hormone. It tells us we're full, we're not hungry anymore, please stop eating. Ghrelin, on the other hand, is our, um, it's our hunger hormone. So it triggers a very strong, strong sense of hunger. When we don't sleep enough, so less than seven hours of sleep per night, decreases leptin in our brain and increases ghrelin. So that's why when you've had a really bad night of sleep, you've been tossing and turning all night, and you get up and you're hungry and you keep eating, 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 and nothing seems to satisfy you is because our hunger hormone has overridden our hormone that tells us that we're full. So less than five hours of sleep also, um, some other studies have shown even on the same restricted calorie diet as someone who is getting seven to nine hours of sleep, less than five hours of sleep, weight loss is more likely to come from lean body mass. So right, so our muscle mass, not fat, and sleep deprivation causes your body to be stingy about giving up stored fat because like we established before, it's protecting itself from a perceived threat. It's making sure that it's storing it up for a rainy day because right, we're in danger. 
And um, getting seven to nine hours of sleep, the studies show that about eight and a half hours of sleep is the sweet spot. Weight loss is much more likely to come from fat mass while preserving muscle mass. So I have a lot of patients that they talk to me and they're like, you know, Dr. Toth, I'm doing, you know, everything as far as diet, I'm doing what you and the nutritionists recommend. Um, I'm exercising and I'm still not losing weight. What's going on? And so we talk, I said, okay, what's your sleep like? We talk about their sleep. They have trouble falling asleep or staying asleep, or they're cutting their sleep short in order to exercise, to get up in the morning and exercise. And the analogy is you're like, well, that's what I'm supposed to do, right? Exercise is more beneficial than sleep is. Well, the analogy that I use is cutting down on sleep to prioritize exercise is like stepping over $100 bills to pick up dimes. Yes, the theory is there that the exercise is going to be more beneficial for weight loss, but the data shows that without sleep, that's really not the case. So if it comes to prioritizing sleep or prioritizing exercise, my advice is sleep wins out every time. Lack of sleep, so right back to leptin and ghrelin, our, our lack of sleep is causing us to also crave different foods than if we have enough sleep. So increased cravings when we're sleep deprived, right? We crave salty snacks. We crave sweet snacks and desserts, um, sugar-rich foods, carbohydrate-rich foods like bread and pasta, and caffeine, right? Because we're sleep deprived, caffeine gives us that boost of energy to get through our day. Um, however, caffeine, studies have shown, it directly affects the release of cortisol, right? Our stress hormone, which leads to weight gain, especially fat mass weight gain. And when we're sleep deprived, we're not really craving healthier foods such as fruits and vegetables, protein rich foods, um, dairy and healthy fatty foods. It's usually more the junky fats we decide to go for. So that also, right, sleep, it's like, okay, that's fine, right? We, we wear our sleep deprivation as badges of honor, not realizing it actually is very detrimental to our health and is sabotaging our efforts to try to lose weight and whatever weight we're trying to lose. So the how, how can functional medicine and clinical nutrition help? There's a lot of different ways we can do this. Um, so if, you, if you're a patient of Align Modern Health or a functional medicine patient, you kind of know this already. If you're new to um, Align Modern Health, what we do is every, every patient, we start with a very thorough health history, a very thorough intake. Um, you'll fill out paperwork ahead of time that us as the functional medicine providers read to make sure that we know your past medical history, we know um, family history, what your current symptoms are, things that you're struggling with, that sort of thing. Um, we talk more about that at your appointment. So we wanna to get to know you as a whole person. We wanna to get to know what your digestion is like, what your sleep is like, what your energy is like, your stress levels are like, what your diet is like. And from there, you know, talk about, figure out what your goals for treatment are and make sure that your goals for treatment and practitioner's goals for treatment are aligned to make sure that we can get you to meet those health goals. Um, if you're in person, physical examination, so like any other doctor would do, right, we check your vitals, we listen to your heart, listen to your lungs, do an abdominal exam, check your lymph nodes, check your thyroid, all of that. If it's telemedicine, obviously we, we can't do the full physical examination, but we, we do partially what we're able to do over video. Um, from there, we order diagnostic blood work, so we do a more expansive panel than most doctors do, um, just because we look for not only, right, blood sugar, cholesterol, Okay, fine. Yes, those are factors into your health. However, we want to look at nutrient status. We want to take a look and see if there's any inflammation going on. We run a thyroid panel. I personally run a thyroid panel on every single one of my patients just to see because if your thyroid isn't working, your metabolism isn't working. Um, I also we do a snapshot of cortisol, your stress hormone, um, as well as its precursor hormone, DHEA sulfate, to see where your stress level is at. Do we need to dig deeper into that? Um, and from there, we also have some other um, specialty testing that we can utilize. So whether it's uh, digging a little bit deeper into your cortisol, your stress hormone with a saliva test, maybe there's some digestive issues going on that are causing you to not absorb uh, nutrients properly. So we utilize a stool test or a breath test or something along those lines. Um, from there, once we get all of those, we the test results back from the blood work, from specialty testing if it's indicated, as well as looking at the data from your physical examination and your history, we come up with a customized treatment plan. So no two patients are the same at all. No two patients' treatment plans are going to be exactly the same. 
Some patients need more guidance in a certain direction. Some need more in another direction. For some people, it's you know something completely different than the first two. So that, um, as far as treatment plans are concerned, it depends. Oop, there we go. That's what I was looking for. Um, treatment plans are different based on what you specifically need. Um, nutritional counseling is another uh, service that we offer at Align Modern Health. We do have four nutritionists on staff that are fantastic. I work with them for, I would say, at least 98% of my patients. And they are there because we don't find it we, what's the word I'm looking for? We don't find it reasonable to ask you to make these changes and say, here, these are the changes I want you to make. See me in three months without any sort of guidance or help in the process. So our nutritional, uh, our uh, clinical nutritionists are fantastic because they help, they give as much or as little instruction and guidance as you're looking for. Um, and then as well as support along the journey from me, from the nutritionist, from other team members here at Align Modern Health. Um, we pride ourselves, I pride myself, I like to do uh, frequent check-ins, especially in the beginning of our uh, treatment protocol, just because that's when things are going to be the most challenging, that's when things are the newest, right? What we would, we have you um, following treatment wise is generally something different than you've ever done before. And once again, don't find it, I don't find it practical or reasonable to ask you to make all these changes without me helping you through this and the clinical nutritionist helping you make these changes. And if there are any challenges or any snafus along the way, how to overcome those roadblocks and those obstacles. Okay, so now on to the next slide. So the functional medicine approach. So specific dietary changes are based on lab findings and never without support. So like I said on the last slide, the things, the changes that I ask you to make, I definitely will make sure that I and the nutritionist will be supporting you through all of that. And once again, depending on diet and depending on um, you know, every person is a little bit different as far as nutrients are concerned, as far as macros are concerned, everyone's just a little bit different. So that is based on your lab findings. Um, customized supplementation recommendations for nutrient deficiencies or imbalances. So for some of my patients, all they need is a little bit of a tweak to their diet and that works for them. Some patients are a little bit more uh, imbalanced or deficient with certain nutrients. So maybe it's adding in a multivitamin or a probiotic or some omegas or something along those lines. Maybe there's an underlying infection that we have to utilize or we have to treat first before we can even get to the weight loss, right? Because oftentimes weight gain can be a, uh, a symptom rather than a root cause personalized exercise recommendations as well. So that is something every person comes in need, needing something different. Um, and unfortunately, right, with, with social media and different things and different influencers, um, there's so many different exercises out there that everyone touts as being the best or the most effective. And a lot of my patients come in and have absolutely no idea. And, uh, you know, the, the fasted cardio is always touted to be the gold standard for weight loss when really – uh, research has been showing that longer intensity, lower duration, or no, lower intensity, longer duration exercise is actually much more effective in causing um, fat burn rather than building muscle and, um, or even just like firing uh, blood sugar, utilizing blood sugar. So like Pilates or walking or aqua jogging or something along those lines where you're still able to have somewhat of a conversation, but it's longer, like 45 minutes to an hour instead of like a quick 30 minute burst session on the Peloton, which I love Peloton. I'm not, I'm not saying anything about that, but everyone needs something a little bit different. And so therefore the exercise recommendations are going to differ based on each patient. Um, stress reduction techniques and healthy sleep hygiene is also something huge. That's usually the, the first layer where I start. Um, so whether it's something like bringing in some sort of gratitude practice or journaling or meditation, or oftentimes I refer a lot of my patients to acupuncture across the hall because it's great for stress reduction. Um, and also with sleep, so healthy sleep hygiene, 
So yes, everyone's like, okay, you know, I, I don't look at my phone overnight. I put my screens away, but maybe there's, there's something going on as far as why you're having trouble falling asleep or staying asleep. Maybe you need a little bit of help with um, your brain creating its own melatonin. One of the big recommendations I make for all of my patients, if they're having trouble sleeping is tart, drinking tart cherry juice. Tart cherry juice is amazing because it has the precursors that our bodies need in order to create our own melatonin. And the, the research has been showing that people that drink 16 ounces of tart cherry juice every night for two weeks um, have shown on average to have an increase of about 85 to 90 minutes more restful sleep per night. Like that's huge, right? And something that, that's really simple like that can make a huge difference because then instead of sleeping five hours, you're sleeping closer to eight hours and you're feeling more energized and everything else starts to fall into place after that. So that's also, you know, each person's a little bit different. And that is also something that we work to address right off, uh, right from the get go. All right, so thank you for joining us. Um, if you have any questions, please type questions into the Q&A feature. Um, and we also offer complimentary 15 minute consultations with either myself or one of my colleagues um, at our different clinics. Uh, you can call the phone number or you can visit alignmodernhealth.com. Um, but yeah, so I'll, I'll wait a second. Um, if you have any questions, you can type them into the Q&A box and then I will answer some. Okay, so the first question, do you have a recommendation for a smart scale? I bought one from Beep Health, but it broke down. Um, so the one that I just bought is a Fit Track. It's from Amazon. I like it. I've, I've had it for a few weeks now. It's been working really nicely. Um, so that is one that I, I definitely have been some getting some good use out of. Um, but I'm trying to think if there's any other brands that I'm very familiar with at this point in time. Um, I don't think so. However, just kind of looking through and reading through um, the different features that it allows you to have. So what it's looking at specifically, um, depending on what you're looking for, the ones that I look for the most, the features are muscle mass, fat mass, bone mass, water, and uh, you can get fancier or simpler from there. Okay, can I spell the juice that I just mentioned? Sure, so tart, so T-A-R-T, -T, cherry, juice. So you can get it at Amazon, you can get it at Trader Joe's, that's where I get mine. Whole Foods, I'm sure, has it. Um, it's, it's really awesome. If you uh, type up tart and go into Google and Google tart cherry juice benefits, there's all sorts of stuff that pops up. It does some really awesome stuff, um, but sleep in particular, it's really great for. Okay, let's see. Oh my goodness, a whole bunch just came in. Okay, so some of these are um, really specific, and with that, I'm going to recommend um, or recommend that you uh, schedule a consult, a free consult with our providers um, as far as blood work done and cost and all of that. Um, that's something where if you call up even our central scheduling team, they can give you those, uh, those answers. Um, okay, let's see. Do B12, do vitamin B12 injections work for weight loss? Um, vitamin B12, so yes and no. Um, it's a little bit, it's not quite as simple as just the B12 and you lose weight. Um, but B12 is, is something I supplement the majority of my patients on because B12 is, um, it's really only found in animal products. And so with a lot of my patients, I have a lot of vegetarian or vegan patients or just we don't eat enough um, enough animal protein for that to be the case. Um, but B12 is very, very important for stress response. It heals our adrenal glands. So by therefore, by helping to bring up nutrient status, yes, it can help with weight loss. Uh, okay, Ooh, my computer just went nuts. Okay, how much tart cherry juice should you drink each night? Um, 16 ounces is what the research has been showing works the best. Um, 16 ounces every night for about two weeks. That's where they see the, the most benefits as far as sleep is concerned. 
Okay, how, ooh, I love this, for this question. How accurate are BMI calculations? Even my friends who seem in great shape and seem to have healthy weight management come up as obese on the BMI, BMI scale. Ooh, I love this question, thank you. So BMI, BMI is, literally it's your height divided by your weight. It takes nothing into consideration as far as your body composition, right? It doesn't take any of that. Uh, most, I would say most professional athletes come up as obese as far as BMI is concerned. And we look at a lot of them, we're like, you are 300 pounds of just pure muscle. But that unfortunately, the, the BMI, all it takes into account is your height and your weight. So I'm going to say that that, and my personal opinion on the matter is that they are not accurate at all. I do not use BMI as any sort of anything except for the fact that insurance wants to see it. Otherwise, I don't use it for anything as far as goal setting, weight loss, any of that, just because it doesn't take into any of that account. Um, also, the I was talking with a patient yesterday as far as bone density. So she was saying, you know, I'm doing everything you're asking me to do. I'm exercising more, but I keep gaining weight. Well, got her on the SMART scale and saw that her bone density had increased. So that that whole, you know, when you were a kid and your your family members would be like, no, he's, he's you know, he or she is not big. They're just big bones. And we're like, okay, they're just trying to, to pacify us. No, that's actually a thing. So that's something that right BMI doesn't take into consideration. So thank you. I love that question. Let's, let's see, what else do we have here? Do you ever prescribe compound vitamin supplements versus multivitamin? Um, so as far, every person's a little bit different. Um, compound pharmacies usually, so I, you need to have prescription rights for that, which as a chiropractor, I do not. Um, however, each page, I do have access to vitamins that are um, only able to be purchased with a medical license. So they're a little bit, they're kind of in between like what you would buy at, you know, Target and GNC versus a compounding pharmacy. They're, they're more potent. So not quite compound vitamins, but almost. Is there a way to target that abdominal fat that is accumulated as a result of stress release or cortisol? Yes, yes, there is. And that kind of goes back to what um, the, the what we were talking about as far as um, the different facets of, of what we were talking about in the presentation today. So by decreasing stress is huge by bringing stress levels, bringing you out of the sympathetic state into more parasympathetic by um, optimizing sleep by finding whatever exercise works the best for you, and also making sure that your intake of your different macronutrients, so your proteins, your fats, your carbohydrates, are adequate for your body composition and also for the goals that you have set for yourself. So unfortunately, I can't be much more specific than that without blood work and or specialty testing and a history, but that's kind of my, my answer, all encompassing answer as far as that's concerned. All right. So thank you, everyone. So unfortunately, that's all the time we have for today. Um, I appreciate you signing on and um, joining me today for this presentation. Thank you. Have a wonderful rest of your day and yeah, a wonderful rest of your week as well.